Welcome to this episode of Therapy and Theology, and today's topic is going to have you leaning in. It's a question that many of you sent in, and the question was around anger. I'm really angry. Now, what do I do about it? Well, before I get into the content, I have to let you know that our team put together a really helpful listener guide that you can download for free using the link in the show notes. It's a summary of our discussion that will be so useful for you as you unpack what we discuss, maybe take your own notes, and it'll be a great reference for you as you have conversations with friends or family. I do not want you to get angry trying to keep up with us, and we're going to move pretty fast. So make sure you use that helpful resource. Now, let's dive into today's content. Are you angry right now? Well, no, I'm saying the question, oh, okay. but I relate to it because sometimes things happen and I really do feel angry about it. And a lot of times it's where something is unfair yeah. or not being justly handled or even just a strong emotional reaction to an offense at hand. Mm -hmm. And this is the Bible verse that I think about sometimes. And sometimes I really like it because I'm like, yeah, yeah, that's good. Yeah. Then other times I'm like, oh, I don't really <laughs> want to read this verse right now. And it's from James chapter four. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Mm -hmm. Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You desire, but do not have, so you kill. You covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. You do not have, because you do not ask God. I remember one time, <laughs> Jim, we were in a uh -oh. counseling session, and, um, and you said, do you know the number one thing that couples fight about? This is what you were asking me. Mm -hmm. And so I said all kinds of things, like maybe it's money, maybe it's scheduling, maybe it's raising kids or you know, managing jobs or whatever. And so I had a bunch of thoughts about that. And you said no to every single thing that I said. And then you revealed the answer. You said the number one thing that couples fight about is nothing at all. Mm -hmm. That was in Dr. John Gottman's research. <laughs> I what? remember just sitting there like, no, no, yeah. I, I have fights about something. Right. But then oftentimes it's really not about the thing that we're arguing about. It's usually other things that are bubbling under the surface. And according to James here, instead of me pointing a finger at the other person, it's really addressing me. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from desires that battle within you? Yeah. And so I have to sit with that sometimes because I, do too. I don't, mm -hmm. it, in a moment of anger, I want somebody else to hear my side. And hear it now. And hear it yeah. now. I don't I don't really want to examine <laughs> right. whatever's going on in here. So I resonate with this listener's question. So I'm angry. What do I do about it? I'm going to start with, uh, since you did James 4, just real quickly, um, the idea of there's something you want. We know that wonderful word of desire and lust, epithumia, which can not mean an empty cup. And that is, I want this, fill my cup, and I want it now. The lady at the fast food, you know, drive through is slow, but sometimes God, she's a lot faster than you. See, it's the vertical. We're mad at God at times. Huh. And then certainly uh, we can be mad at someone else. Like, what are you doing? And why are you not doing what I want? But that idea that there's something I want and I don't get it. So I murder in my heart. I mean, it's not just Jesus, you know, over there in John, they're talking about, well, you're actually, a, you lost, you're an adulterer in your heart. You hate someone, you're a murder in your heart. I love the clarity of that, and I'm going to say this, hope it comes out right, whether that's biblically accurate or not, or whether I could just close this book or not, there's so much wisdom in this book that, that I love it as the Word of God, but just as a wisdom book to go, it really is that bad, Joel. If there's something I'm not getting from you and I want it, I'm all right, I can just kill you. Now, I may not come out that at you that way and be, you know, to try to do that, but I look like I hate you inside. You're not doing what I want you to do. It's not just I'm ticked. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm just kind of mad or something. Sometimes in, in, in my, my heart, as we talk with anger, you know, I interviewed anger, in fact, and found out her name was pain. I interviewed anger and found out his name was pain or rage. And I see that a lot with people. I'm saying, you're not just angry here right now, but there's a rage going on like about a two-year-old to four-year-old toddler. I want what I want and I want it now. Mm. And you better give it to me. I think developmentally, a lot of our anger struggles, there's righteous anger, don't get me wrong. But I think developmentally, a lot of our anger struggles are very, very young. I have young grandkids. Oh. So do you. 
You see them if they were mad and they hit their cousin or hit someone else, you kind of expect it. Or the daycare, where my grandkids go, they get a bite report. So grandma, I'm granddaddy, we'll call and say, did she get a bite report today? Kid come at her and she's bitter, bit the kid. You expect that to a degree, right, from a toddler or someone, mm -hmm. but it's going on in our country. We'll get to that later. But there's a lot of anger that I think is more, it's just boiled over into rage. You know, I um, was studying the story of Joseph and how his brother's anger against Joseph, mm -hmm. and it stemmed a lot from jealousy, you know, because I mean, Joseph was yeah. the, the favorite child. And also Joseph apparently got this lavish, lavish gift called a robe, which signaled he wasn't going to have to go out and work like his brothers were. Yeah. And so there was a lot going on. There was mm -hmm. anger. There was envy. There was jealousy. There was strife there. Maybe Joseph flaunted it a little bit, too, every now and then. Yeah. So. You know what? Sometimes younger no, children okay. I mean, really kids, don't right. have to work hard like us oldest children. But that's that a story the for another day. Ain't that the truth? <laughs> but... As I was reading that and I saw the progression mm. where the brother's anger did turn into an eventual plot to kill him, I just thought that's so severe. But what that tells me is there's never just a little bit of anger. Yeah. yeah. There's never just a little bit of jealousy. There's never just a little bit of envy and strife. Those things grow unattended in our heart. They grow. And I know from some of the research we've looked at, I also think probably from John Gottman is one of the number one killers of a relationship is simmering resentment. Mm -hmm. Now, and, and Duke University, by the way, not far from where we are, did a study way, way back, it goes into the 80s, uh, that they did a study that they found empirically that the number one killer in America was unforgiveness. Now you have a best-selling book on forgiveness, right? Because that unforgiveness, there is anger, and far more than that, there's just this rage. I will not forgive you for what you've done. Vengeance is mine, saith me. So they did a study in the somatic, that's the word for body, mm -hmm. but people are like, I'm not forgiving. That's just you drinking poison, expecting somebody else to get sick. Doesn't work. Right. It kills people. I actually think that the Joseph narrative embodies that specifically. Think about really? this. Joseph is thrown into the pit, right? And what do his brothers do while he's in the pit? They plot. They plot. And the Texas, they're eating. Yeah. They're having a meal <laughs> while homeboy is in a pit. So again, we, sometimes we got to take, this is something that you've taught me, Liz. Like, like put yourself in the human situation. Yeah. You're Joseph in the pit. You're like, my brothers have just jacked me up most severely. And now they're enjoying the food. And I can smell the food and hear them chewing and eating and the whole nine yards. And now I'm going to be taken away. Okay, all that happened. So the, the simmering resentment, right? Where is the context that Joseph forgives? In front of a table Ooh. with food. Wow. In a banquet. Where the brothers are asking. Where the bro the whole thing has been put. And I think that Joseph really does. I think because, you know, music does this in terms of our senses. It draws us back to places of trauma. Yeah, so yeah. here's food. Here are the brothers. They're chomping on their food. I think Joseph's like, oh, my gosh. This and now the position has been flipped. I'm not in the in the prison. I'm a prince of Egypt. Mm. And now what am I going to do? And it's in that same context of that anger and of that, like all the things that happened, that forgiveness actually takes place. You know, don't you, this isn't a Hollywood movie, but following that, I've often thought if it was some movie and it was retribution or justice at the end of it, and Joseph said, you bunch of losers, this is who I really am, and I'm going to kill you, there'd be a number of people, I'm not so sure a number of Christians, but in our culture right now in America, it would be a, Serves him right. He was right to do that. Mm. He got him back. I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. To dial that back. What do we learn in Genesis 50, 20, which you've alluded to it? That's uh, that's uh, not my way often as a human. Mm -hmm. It's for vengeance, and yet God's ways are higher. But I think there'd be people who would say, yeah, serves him right. I'm like, that's a, there's a different story here, isn't mm -hmm. there? And from Genesis 37 to Genesis 50, there's a lot of development of Joseph's Big calling, character um, yes, our character yes, to develop, yep. you know, he, yes. his, his character is developed to match his calling. Yes. And then toward the end the, of, of a lot of maturity, he's 17 when the story starts. And toward the end, as we get to Genesis 50, 20, a lot of time has passed. Yep. A lot of other things have passed. And I think it's not time that heals all wounds, but it's the what we plant in the soil of that time that Amen. determines if we heal or not. And of course, we see Joseph's story turns and he doesn't have simmering resentments. He has struggles with forgiving the brothers. He is, he's hurt. He acknowledges that they hurt him, 
But we eventually get to Joseph saying, you intended to harm me. It is a sugarcoat that. No, that's true. He's like, you did intend to harm me. That's good. But God, and I like this turn of events, you know, where you see but God and things turn because there's another perspective operating at the same time. You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish something, to accomplish what is being done, the saving of many lives. So I want to go all the way back to the original thought of you are angry because you're not getting what you want. Mm -hmm. So I think a logical question, and I, I wish that we could go back and sort of replay out the brother's story. How would things have looked? Now, we know God did a lot of good from what happened. Sure. But what if the brothers were to have examined their own heart? What do I really want? And oftentimes the answer to what we really want is not super complicated. It's something pretty basic, but either because we've been given no form for our voice to be expressed or the anger has taken over and we can't logically think what's really driving all of this or because our desire or our need has been expressed in terms of an expectation, which already introduces animosity and simmering mm -hmm. resentments into the conversation. Sometimes we never really get back to the original question. I'm angry because I want something. Now, what is it that I want? And if we can go back to that and really mm -hmm. examine, is this an unrealistic expectation where simmering resentments are getting in there? Or is this a desire that maybe instead of using the approach of anger, maybe through healthy conversation, I could actually get what I want, which would help manage and dissipate and probably even do away with some of the anger. So I'm going to take a stab at this theologically, and then I want to hear the therapeutic uh, part of this. But I think, and we can use the Joseph narrative as a foil or as an example for how to kind of navigate what you've talked about in James chapter four, and then something James says earlier in James 1, 19. Um, but I'm going to call this the anthropocentric view of life. And that just mm -hmm. simply means the human-centered view. So I, the, I kind of joke about it, but basically it's that holy trinity of me, myself, and I. Now, no, notice this in four. Which is not the holy trinity. Which is not the holy trinity. Just as a put of clarification. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for the <laughs> theological check. someone was not listening carefully. Yeah, the unholy trinity. Yes. Uh, me, myself, and I. But that is the lens, the framework, mm -hmm. the anthropocentric or human-centered lens of James chapter 4. And he starts this. What is the source? What's the foundation? What is the wellspring? of these wars and fights among you. And he goes, don't think I'm in you. Passions, desires, all of these types of things. Um, back to the Joseph era and these brothers, we can't know for sure or for certain, but I think we can pretty much get very close to that, like 99%, I would argue, is they want their dad to love him. Mm -hmm. They want the love of a father. Mm -hmm. And in, in the absence of the love of a father is the presence of jealousy of a brother. Come on. Right? Okay. Yeah. Now look at James 1, 19. Look at the structural framework. What James does for us is he gives us a theocentric or a Christocentric framework to see through the lens of Christ or to see through the lens of God, the, theos Christo. Verse 19. I'm going to actually, it's, it's going to read a little bit different from you because I'm actually doing some Greek um, translation in my brain here really quick. But this is the, the main idea. He's saying this. Um, my dear brothers and sisters, understand that understand comes first in the sentence. So, and it's an imperative. So he starts with this, understand, right? Imperative, do this, understand, which is emphatic. And then he says, my dear, and he softens the situation. So he goes strong, understand. And then he goes, my siblings, my dear brothers and sisters. And then he gives the scope, everyone, <laughs> right? Everyone should be, and notice the list. One is quick is too slow. One quick thing, two slow things. What is the quick thing? Quick to listen. Slow to speak and be slow to anger. Um, you've probably heard the phrase, hurry up and listen. Mm -hmm. I, this is where it comes from. <laughs> like, like everything comes back to the biblical text. And it's this desire that mm -hmm. James is trying to get us to combat the desires of James chapter 4 that is quick to, uh, to feel, to fight, to be angry, to get what I, myself, and to I accuse, want. To, to label. Accuse. Yes, exactly. And he's saying, like, slow down. Like and that, that phrase slow in Greek, it has the sense of hesitation or delay. I think this is very important. Yeah. It's not stop. It's slow. It's not that you don't have a voice or a way to feel later on and to, and to legitimize your anger. It just says, 
for a second consider and put a, a stopgap in place so that you can get the full context. By the way, Joy, like this quickly, there is going to be with that a tertiary uh, interpretation along with that because two more things we're going to add to that, which we all know, we've talked about it here. I will not just slow down me and what I'm doing. I will literally slow down my thinking, mm. including the emotional self-regulation, and I will slow down my body, putting me on a path to respond, not react. This works yeah. if we practice it. Yeah. And I've it, discovered yeah. that the that there's a worse feeling for me than whatever has stirred up the anger. Hmm. And the worst feeling is regret. Oof, yeah. So I don't I I sometimes when I'm talking, I will almost feel paralyzed because mm. I'm not able to figure out exactly what I want quickly. Mm. And instead I'm feeling this rush of emotion, this rush of energy, and that energy makes me want to be quick to speak and quick to accuse and quick in all of those ways. But I've learned until I really examine what it is that I want, I need to slow all of that down. And I don't want to say something that I regret because mm -hmm. sometimes out of strong emotion, I'll speak something or I'll make an accusation that's not really true. That for sets example, you up for a reaction hangover right there later, like you get regulated. We've talked about this a bunch. I love where you're leading us here. And I go, can I get a redo? Now the words are gone. Mm. Can I do, I do? And that's that reaction hangover. Really? Like, oh, man. So how that's do a good I way slow to phrase that? that. Yeah, slowing it down. Back to you. But I'm thinking like, okay, in our friendship, yeah. um, maybe you have been really, really busy for a while. Mm -hmm. And I am having that buildup of anxiety that turns into animosity, that turns into simmering resentment. Mm -hmm. And what will happen is some, then I start labeling you as, okay, Joel has been so busy and he doesn't want to spend time with me. Mm -hmm. Now that's probably not what's going on in your head. But in my mind, I'm like, he's selfish. Mm -hmm. He doesn't care. He's consumed with his own thing. He's consumed mm -hmm. with his own thing. He's not picking up on the clues that I'm laying down. Mm -hmm. And he's just basically in his own world without any care or concern for me. Yeah. Now, some of those things may be true, but a lot of them aren't true. But I have to slow down before I start making accusations like, Joel, you're so selfish because me doing that is going to increase the anger because now it's going to be my anger multiplied with your frustration yep. or possibly even anger as well. Yeah. But if I were to back up and I would just say to you, OK, this is what I'm feeling, Joel. Now, whether it's justified or what, I'm not going to make an accusation. Just, this is what I'm feeling. This is what's feeding that feeling. This is the frustration that is causing me. Now, Joel, I need you to share some facts with me so I can better understand the dynamic. And then once you share the facts, now together, let's figure out what do I need, what do you need, and how do we move forward? I think the beauty of that is you move us from monologue to dialogue of conversation, mm. right? Monologue, everything's happening in the chamber of your heart, and you're creating presuppositions or pre-understandings and preemptive um, like answers of what the other person is going to do and say. But when you slow down and you take a self-assessment of how you're feeling and then you invite the other person to be able to speak to the truth of what they're actually feeling, the slowing down to listen has a, has a duality to it. It's, it's dialogical in the sense that, yes, you get to know deeper and better of yourself, but you also get to know better and deeper of the other person. And that might change the entire framework of the of the anger that you felt in the first place it might justify your anger <laughs> where you're like hey like okay i had these thoughts those have been confirmed now mm -hmm. and now we're gonna have boundaries or consequences for um what we're going to do in life it or it might change that anger and in its place have empathy yeah. and compassion because you're like better understanding of what's really happening in the totality of the experience, you and me. Yes. You know, there is a place for righteous anger. Mm -hmm. And I've given this some thought too, because sometimes I want to be right anger, you know, <laughs> and that's not the same thing as mm -hmm. righteous yeah. anger. Mm -hmm. And so I, I have also learned to examine my heart. What is this anger really driving me toward? Righteous anger would drive me toward doing something 
positive, making something right. And it's not just for my sake, but it's for a greater good. Mm -hmm. But we don't want to violate scripture in an effort mm -hmm. to defend another person or to defend scripture. Say that again for the people in the back, please. Yeah. That's a good we one. We don't want to violate scripture in an effort, effort to defend scripture, defend another person, or even defend myself. Mm -hmm. So we can't help what's coming at us, but we can help how we move toward it. And if there's righteous anger, then we have to stay in alignment with God's word. But it is okay to fight with that kind of energy for something that's right. Mm -hmm. But we have to stay in alignment with scripture. But then the other kind of anger is, I just want to be right anger, <laughs> you know? And so a question, I know you guys have heard me say it before, but it really does help me. Am I trying to prove that I'm right? Or am I trying to improve this relationship? Yes. Because I can't do both at the same time. Mm. Okay, Joel, any last words about anger? I want to hear from Jim. I felt like I kind of took us all the way through the theology oh, piece, but Aww, I kind of... Listen to you being so like slow to speak. Yeah. We're going to transition over to Jim. <laughs> You've changed. Wow. <laughs> Look Have at that. Have been watching therapy and theology? Yeah, I've been embodying it. <laughs> I love you, buddy. Yeah, what do you want to hear? Well, okay, let's say someone comes to you and they mm -hmm. say, I am really having an issue with anger. Mm -hmm. There's nothing major going on in terms of like one incident that's making yeah. me so angry, but rather I'm finding myself quick tempered and I'm angry about a lot. Like I'm angry at the person who cut me off in traffic. I'm angry at the grocery store attendant for not, you know, like moving along fast enough. I'm angry at my husband, I'm angry at my kids, and I'm just, I don't wanna be an angry person, but my actions are making me add up to be an angry person. My mind, in rigorous honesty, is going to think in that moment and, and hypothesize and not lean with this, but my mind will think, I wonder if this person is in the victim triangle. Mm -hmm. They have a victim martyr mentality. I do not judge them for that, and with that, if they're in this triangle of the victim triangle, they will be as a victim and they'll need God or somebody else to rescue them or they'll make people their persecutor or what we call perpetrator. So I want to, I would think I'm, I'm contemplating. I wonder if they're in that victim martyr place. You know, everything's after me. This is not right. Lots of injustices in the world were breaking news. The world right now is filled with injustices and it's going to be that way for a while. It's, been, it's probably been that way for a while already. So then I want to interview the anger. I'll tell that person one example, you've seen it, uh, where I would say, let's just have for a moment, bring out a chair in my office, an empty chair, write a three by five card that says anger in it, disappointment, what have you. And so I want, let's interview that anger. Now you come sit in this chair, it's so easy, it's an experiential thing, huh. and say so you become angered and let me interview you. Anger, how long have you been present in Bill's life? And, and tell me, so a long time. Uh, what were some three things you were angry about in childhood? And just don't edit. If it comes to their mind, they say it. And say, now let's go to current. What's going on right now? Is there anything, anger that you see with Bill, let's say, that's out of alignment? Yeah, he knows he's overworking. He has some disappointments. He doesn't want to face the disappointments. His kids or his spouse or whatever or his job. And say, so he's not really grieving that because one of the stages of grief, number two, anger turned outward. Uh, at the world of mm -hmm. anger turned inward, which is often depression. Mm. So I can begin to interview that. Now, you folks at home, you can do that just with a journal. Put down, hi, my name is Anger. If you grab your thumb, a friend of mine taught me this a long time ago. There are many versions of it. But underneath anger is often hurt, injustice, fear, or frustration. This, grabbing your thumb just helps you kind of ground your body. Hurt, injustice, fear, frustration. Hurt is, I'm hurt. And see, again, you interviewed Anger and found out his name, her name was Hurt. Injustice, Hurt, Injustice. Change it to Unjustice, and this will spell Huff. I'm in a Huff. Hurt, Unjustice. This is not fair what's going on. Often you may be right. Hurt, Unjustice, Fear. I'm afraid. I don't like what's going on. Or the idea that I'm just frustrated, a blocked goal. You can go deeper over a, 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 the napkin at Panera or Starbucks and say, let's do this right here. What's under that? Where do we have that in the Bible? Proverbs 20, verse 5, the purposes in a person's heart are deep waters. waters. You need to not yeah. snorkel, but do a little scuba and say, let's think beneath. Let's go a little lower and say, tell me more. Three words, tell me more about that. I find the average person without having to go to counseling can sit down and someone say, you know what? I think that's what it is. Here come the tears. And here comes something else. Here comes past betrayal and something new. A friend also 
betrayed their spouse and now you have PTSD. So interview anger and you can do it by yourself. Like what's out of alignment in my life? And then if you land, but this is unjust, this is really righteous indignation, I would say, right. But Joel's going to remind us, we're going to remind ourselves, how do I be angry, but sin not and not want to turn and execute judgment on people. People will get that simple thing I've just done, tons of data and they can do it at home. I like that a lot. And then I would add, if I might, a second question. Please. So it's like, okay, I'm hurt. So I'm interviewing anger and I Mm -hmm. discover I'm hurt or I'm frustrated Mm -hmm. and whatever, whichever of the four that you land on. And then add this question. And this is the story I'm telling myself. Brilliant. Because when you add on, and this is the story I'm telling myself, that's where you can pick up on, I feel like everyone's out to get me. I feel like nothing ever goes my way. God is certainly not intervening as he should. Yes. And that's where we can start to pick up on. I really, I can't, I like, I bristle every time I hear victim mentality. And it may be because sometimes I have a victim mentality. I, I don't do know. From time to time. But I I don't I don't want to be caught in that victim triangle. I don't want to have a perpetrator and a rescuer. Mm-hmm. Like I, I want to get out of that. And so it helps me when I say, okay, these are things happening. Like the anger is in an indication of a hurt that I'm feeling. And the hurt that I'm feeling, you know, this is I'm going to journal all about that. But then it's even more important for me to say, and this is the story I'm telling myself, because if there is any of that um, victimization or if there is any of that thought where, you know, like this proves that I'm less than this proves that he just doesn't care, whatever. The story that I'm telling myself is where the real trauma sometimes is sitting. And so that helps me to add that on. And then once I see and this is what I'm telling myself now, what's something positive that I can do to not sit in these hard feelings, but start making progress towards something better? And you know, a little tricky thing. I, uh, boy, wow. I hope this is being recorded. That was really good. Seriously. My goodness. Um, and, and practical, which is part of your original vision with therapy and theology. We were getting a lot of theology and just some practical counseling and therapy right here at this table. Thank you for what you did with that. I have never said this to you before. I'm going to say it now. I am not a proponent of what is popular in our culture. I understand why it's there, but I'm not a proponent of anger management. I'm going to manage my anger, and I'm going to, maybe it's court appointed some people, let me just manage, no, no, no. I want to say what, I want to interview my anger and find out what's going on. Anger is often a check engine light on the dashboard of my life. And if I go below and pull codes and go, oh, this is that, guess what? That light goes off. I I just did it with Lexus down the street. And the car wouldn't start, the light was on, they had to fix it. It wasn't cheap, right? But it was worth it. Now I can drive again. I wasn't going to be able to fix it on my own. Mm. But the idea of saying, I'm not going to manage my anger, mm. but to say, what's it trying to do? And when I go below and think beneath and apply the Bible to it and, and, and right-sizing this, analyzing the stories in my head, guess what? The anger gets managed. I don't want to put, as to quote C.S. Lewis, he said, basically, it's a paraphrase, but it's in there. Put first things first. And second things fall right in place. But if you put second things first, you'll lose first and second things. Yeah. So the second thing is get rid of the anger and manage it and just interview it. And then anger will be well managed. Mm, that's so good. Well, thank you. Joel, do you have any last words you want to say before? Yeah, we I today? just want to quote James 120. We talked about 19 and we know context is so important. Just as a, um, a way to summarize exactly what Jim just said. And what our discussion has been, this is what James 1.20 says, for human anger, and it's important that he emphasizes human anger because it's different from righteous anger. He goes, from human anger, for human anger, does not accomplish God's righteousness. Mm, so good. So helpful. I think I need to go home and pull out my journal and examine where have I been frustrated or hurt lately that it could potentially leak out in my life as anger and do some self-examination. And My prayer is that um, this has been a non-threatening way for us to examine anger that honestly, I think we all deal with at times. So I hope today has been really helpful. Hi friend, thanks for watching this video. Proverbs 31 Ministries is a nonprofit organization 
and our mission is to meet you and women like you with scriptural truth and encouragement in the moments you need it most. Every day we offer free biblical resources, devotions, podcasts, videos, and more, all to help women around the world know the truth and live the truth because it changes everything. Find out more about how you can get involved today by visiting us at Proverbs31.org.